Okay, so, um, yeah, on page 59, it talks about case manager, and there's a small paragraph about that, and it's written as if OTs make great case managers, and they do, but I don't want anyone to think that a case manager role is something you just walk into without any experience. People talk about OT, write about OT as if they're everything to everybody, and while OT has some, OTs have some great skills, there's some things that take time to develop, and if there's any social workers among us in this class, uh, you'll know that case management is not an easy task. So um, let's not underplay the importance and the difficulty of that role. On page 60, um, when it starts talking about activity director, I think you should you should really read this carefully. If you were to read it and not read who's doing what, it sounds a lot like moral treatment and work cure from our history. Yet activity directors in nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities are typically um, OT aides or other professions that are, that are um, at a semi-professional level. They're not paid well, they, they fill a really important role and OTs would make great activity directors, but the position doesn't pay enough and doesn't involve direct treatment of clients, and so OTs are not usually in that position. And it's a real shame, because it, it's a, such a great fit for an OT. Um, so that's just a couple of paragraphs. I think the last paragraph on the left-hand column of 60 talks about the National Association of Activity Professionals and where they talk about examples of, of work done in that role, again, it is OT all the way. But here it's coming at it from an activity director perspective, which I find interesting. Um, the second column on page 60, this, the, last full, the second to last full paragraph, states OT practitioners are responsible for maintaining professional standing and responsibility by delivering services that reflect philosophical base of OT. I think it would be a great thing, the next observation you do of OT is to do your observation and then um, Go back and read the chapter, it's chapter three, on philosophical base, and see how much you think what you observed reflects our philosophical base. I think sometimes you'll be really surprised. Um, box 7-1 on page 63, uh, certainly not to memorize. None of this is to memorize because all of our exams are open book. I just want you to take a look at all the different people that could make up the team OT is part of. Uh, and I think Table 7-2 is really important. Um, I'm almost positive this table is on the midterm, maybe as a matching question. Uh, but it talks about the standards, knowledge, critical reasoning, interpersonal relationships, per performance skills, and ethics. Uh, which pretty much tell the picture of, of um, areas of standards that we have to work within and uphold. Um, page, table 7.3, again, interesting specialty certification. I'd like you to keep in mind, none of these are required. These, these areas of specialty are so important, and it's so important to have specialized knowledge. Um, there's board certification in four different areas, but none of these are required. So you could work in um, inpatient rehab for 10 years and find a job um, in gerontology or geriatrics or mental health, even different, and go right into it, not have to take another board, not have to pass a test, um, and be expected to be capable of functioning in that role because it's part of your basic OT training. But again, don't underestimate the specialty and the development that has to occur to function as an effective and ethical practitioner 
in these specialty areas, even though you're not required to be, quote, board certified. Okay, well, that takes us through Chapter 7. Chapter 8 is a big one, and so I'm going to stop this video and start a new one um, for Chapter 8.